Hello, welcome to Politics and Prose Bookstore. My name is Alexis. I will be your host for the evening. Please bear with me through a few housekeeping details. Those of you who have been here before will have heard all this already, but bear with me for the new people. Please take this opportunity to silence your electronic devices, cell phones, anything that might make noise. We want to avoid awkward interruptions during the event. Uh, there will be a question and answer session, and we absolutely encourage questions. We would appreciate it if you could step up to this microphone right here to my left uh, so that the audience can hear you, the author can hear you, and so that C-SPAN and our recording can hear you as well. I think I speak for everyone who has attended one of our events before when I ask that you put your question in the form of an actual question. <laughs> And finally, when the event is over, we would really appreciate it if you could help out our event staff by folding up your chair and leaning it against something sturdy. So with all that out of the way, this evening we are very pleased to welcome Ali Soufan to discuss his new book, Anatomy of Terror, From the Death of Bin Laden to the Rise of the Islamic State. Mr. Soufan is a former FBI agent who was responsible for supervising and investigating significant terrorism cases for the Bureau. He is currently the CEO of the Sufan Group, which in provides intelligence services to governments and multinational organization. Mr. Sufan's first book, The Black Banners, The Inside Story of 9-11 and the War Against Al-Qaeda, was a New York Times top 10 bestseller. His latest book, Anatomy of Terror, is in many ways a continuation of the work begun with that first volume. In Anatomy of Terror, Mr. Sufan explores the ways in which Osama bin Laden's ideology, far from dying with the terrorist, has grown and evolved in the years since his death, ultimately leading to the creation of the Islamic State. I will leave it to our guests to delve deeper into this topic. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Ali Sufan to Politics and Prose. Good evening. Uh, what a great pleasure to be here with you at uh, Politics and Prose. Um, what I want to do today, I want to take um, about uh, 15 to 20 minutes to talk about the book and why I wrote the book, and then I would like to have uh, a more uh, interaction relationships and hearing your questions. I'm sure you have a lot on your mind, especially what we, we are seeing today, uh, you know, in Manchester and other places. Um, uh, I was an FBI agent. Um, I started in 1997 with the Bureau. I was assigned to the New York office, and I did something dumb at the time. I wrote a memo about a guy that I believe he's going to be very, very dangerous, and his name is Osama bin Laden. <laughs> uh, uh, at the time, you know, um, my immediate supervisors did not know much about Osama bin Laden, but it made it all the way <coughs> to the head of the national security uh, in, in, in the FBI, in the New York office, uh, John O'Neill, and John knew that we have an ongoing case uh, very closely held in the U.S. government between the FBI and CIA in monitoring the activities of this guy, Osama bin Laden, who has been uh, trying to create some problems. At the time, the U.S. government was viewing him as a financier of terrorism rather than, um, you know, an active uh, in, in terrorism operations. Um, it back, uh, you know, after after I wrote that memo, um, you know, John told me that I need to focus on Osama bin Laden. I was working other terrorist groups on the side, focusing on Iraq at the time, you know, because we considered Iraq, from an intelligence perspective, we considered Iraq a state sponsor of terrorism. So working foreign counterintelligence against the Iraqi government here in the United States uh, was being handled by the Joint Terrorism Task Force. Um, but also at the same time, I worked, I worked Al-Qaeda and I worked Osama bin Laden. After the East Africa embassy bombings, um, I was uh, shifted to focus mainly on Al-Qaeda. So I'm in so many ways like Forrest Gump. I found myself in the middle of a lot of big investigations. And at one point, you know, some of uh, my, my, my commanders, if you want to call them in Al-Qaeda, saying, hey, by the way, um, you're in charge of this investigation. I'm like, okay, um, I'll try to figure it out. Um, so I was lucky in a sense that I have 
um, I had um, a front seat to history unfolding. And a lot of these things um, ended up in 9-11. And between 9-11 and the East Africa embassy bombings, I was involved in so many uh, operations around the world that disrupted terrorist plots. Uh, we were very successful in stopping al-Qaeda and its networks from conducting terrorist plots in, in Manchester, actually, in, in, in the UK, in Morocco, in Saudi Arabia, in, in Jordan during the millennium. They wanted to assassinate the Pope and blow up a couple of um, uh, hotels and uh, border crossings with Israel, uh, the millennium could have been totally different if they were successful in doing so. So, um, so I, I had some experience in, in the organization, the group, how they think, the mentality, and then 9-11 happened. And that the organization that attacked us on 9-11 um, sees no more. You know, we destroyed that organization. We destroyed their command and control in Afghanistan. Many of the leaders uh, escaped Afghanistan. Some of them were killed. Uh, some of them are spending the rest of their lives in uh, a Caribbean retirement in Guantanamo Bay. Um, others um, were, uh, were, were able to go to different locations and set up affiliates for the organization. And we hear about all these affiliates today, AQAP, Al-Qaeda and the Arabian Peninsula, Peninsula, AQIM, Al-Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb. Some people want to assist with the Shabaab. Some other people want to assist in the establishment of Al-Qaeda in Iraq and so forth. So um, after, after we finished 9-11 and the investigation of 9-11 um, and the invasion of Iraq, Al-Qaeda mutated. Al-Qaeda is no more an organization. It became a message. And that message became a very potent message. By the time Osama bin Laden was killed, uh, he had affiliates in places like Yemen, in places like Somalia, in places like you know, North Africa, mainly Algeria, all the way down to Mali. They have affiliates that support the narrative of Al-Qaeda in places like Indonesia and Southern Philippines, and even organizations that pledge Baya or allegiance to Al-Qaeda in the Caucasus, uh, in the Balkans, and so forth. So um, the organization was spreading, but it wasn't spreading as a terrorist organization the way it was spreading as a message. It was more, uh, uh, more a message than a group. Um, when bin Laden was killed on May 2nd, uh, 2011, um, I was happy that we finally got him, but also I was troubled. I was troubled that I felt if we don't counter that message appropriately, counter the narrative, counter the ideology, bin Laden will be more popular dead then he was alive. He is going to be a martyr. And I wrote the, sec I wrote the same night, I wrote my concerns in an op-ed in the New York Times. The New York Times contacted me and said, can you write something Bin Laden just killed? What do you think about it? So, um, you know, I, I was happy that my mentor, the person I mentioned, John O'Neill, uh, unfortunately, he died on 9-11. He uh, left the FBI to become the um, the head of security for the World Trade Center, and he was helping people. He was getting out people from the building when the building collapsed. So I was happy to see bin Laden dead because uh, I lost friends, and I lost mentors, and I lost um, a lot of uh, people along the way who uh, fought um, to stop this guy's narrative and this guy's bloodshed. Unfortunately, 16 years after 9-11, I stand before you here, and uh, I don't feel any better about uh, the Al-Qaeda network today. Uh, 16 years after 9-11, we still don't have a deep understanding of that network that's trying to cause harm. Uh, 16 years after 9-11, we don't have a comprehensive strategy that put all our assets together, focusing on eliminating that threat. It's fine and dandy to kill people every now and then. It's fine and dandy to arrest people every now and then. It's fine and dandy to even, you know, use drones and use all these other tactics and special operation, uh, special operation military special operation, those guys do phenomenal job and God bless them, but it's not, it's not fair to just 
entrust that to our military or our intelligence. The diplomats have something to do here. The people who work in aid programs have something to do here. Law enforcement has something to do here. Uh, we had since 9-11 a lot of tactics, and most of our tactics have been phenomenally successful. But the accumulation of the tactics without a comprehensive strategy led to a strategic failure. And that's why 16 years after 9-11, 20 years almost after bin Laden declared war on the United States, we have a threat that's way more dangerous today than it used to be back when bin Laden did 9-11. So how is it more dangerous, right? On the eve of 9-11, bin Laden had 400 members who pledged allegiance to al-Qaeda. 19 of them died on 9-11. Today, al-Qaeda in Iraq and in Syria alone had 20,000 people. Today, al-Qaeda in Yemen, which is al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, have between four to 5,000 people. Today, al-Qaeda in Somalia have up to 7,000 people. Today, AQIM, an organization that was not able to get their act together. They always fought with each other uh, based on tribal boundaries, ethnic boundaries. The Fulanis, who are um, blacks, won't work with the Arabs, and the Arabs won't work with the Berber. So the organization was always fragmented. Just about two months ago, they got together and they pledged allegiance to the local manager of Al-Qaeda, in North Africa and a Sahel region, an Algerian, by the name of Abu Musab Abdel Wadud. And all of them through him pledge bayah to Al Qaeda Central and to Ayman Zawahiri. So we see the organization growing. Now, why is the organization growing? The organization is growing because they are taking advantage of the chaos that's happening today in the Middle East. And that's something did not happen because Zawahiri is a genius. Zawahiri is the current leader of Al-Qaeda. That happened because bin Laden ordered it to happen before these bullets of the Navy SEALs took him down. Bin Laden was watching the Arabs spring from his hideout, and he realized that there was something historic happening here. He told his commanders, forget everything I told you. I always told you, don't worry about anything. Just hit the United States, hit the West, hit the head of the snake. We can kill um, all these regimes if we destroy America or if we make America so weak and so scared to be involved in the Middle East. Now I'm telling you something totally different. I'm telling you even do not send people to go to Afghanistan because we already, according to his words when he said defeated and broke the cross in Afghanistan. Now we have to focus on the Middle East because what we are experiencing today is something so big that we did not see in the Muslim world since the time of Saladin. That's his words. So let's focus on, 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 on guaranteeing that when these regimes are falling, when Ali Abdullah is fall, uh, Saleh is falling in Yemen, when Muammar al-Qazafi is falling in Libya, okay, when um, Zain al-Abidin bin Ali is falling in Tunisia, let us guarantee that nobody is going to come and fill that vacuum. And most importantly, let's guarantee that there is no democracy. Because God forbid the people have uh, the ability to choose. Democracy is totally against Sharia. So the believers and the unbelievers um, have the same uh, vote and they are equal in their selection of what kind of governments they want. So in a way, his commanders understood exactly what he was saying. There's something called the management of savagery. It's a strategy that has been out, you know, uh, about, you know, how Al-Qaeda view uh, its, its strategy, you know. So first, hit the United States until the United States is so weak to support these Arab regimes. Second, create a vacuum. Don't allow anybody to, 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 to fill that vacuum because whoever is going to fill it is going to be the new dictator working on the behalf of the Americans as they see it. So um, create this vacuum. Manage that chaos and that savagery that's happening over there. Number three, you declare a state. And then after you declare a state, you can start the uh, final confrontation with the West and with the unbelievers.
That's their strategy. So Bin Laden, basically, they understood when he said, we're at this phase, on phase two, let's create that chaos. And Bin Laden told his commanders, I know what I'm telling you when we, I talk about chaos, I, it means that a lot of people are going to die. A lot of Muslims are going to die. And then he continued to say, to write, we have to kill them to save them. We have to kill them to save them. So when Bin Laden died, that order that he gave just before he was killed, it changed the whole power structure in the Middle East in such a phenomenal way. Now you see the terrorism threat is totally different than it used to be back around 9-11. Now the terrorist threat is embedded in very complicated geopolitical wars. What's happening in Syria is not only a civil war in Syria. Let's not fool ourselves. It's not only people who wanted liberty and freedom. That was at the very beginning of the Syrian rebellion. It's a geopolitical conflict, and it is an international conflict. That's why we are there. That's why the Russians are there. That's why the Iranians are there. That's why the Gulf states are there. That's why the Turks are there. It's not about the Syrian people. Regionally, sectarianism is being used to score geopolitical points against, you know, uh, against regional powers, against each other, between Iran and between Saudi Arabia. And we see it all across these conflict zones. And who is benefiting directly from that? Extremist groups, both on the Shia side and on the Sunni side. So, on May 2011, May 2nd, 2011, we killed bin Laden. We did not kill Al-Qaeda. Those Navy SEALs took down a messenger. But unfortunately, our political leadership did not take down the message. And that's what we have today. So why did I write this book? I wrote that book because even 16 years after 9-11, we still don't have a deeper understanding of the enemy. What do I mean by that? Sun Tzu across the ages said, if you know your enemy and know yourself, you will win a hundred times in a hundred battles. Do we know our enemy on that level? My God, if you watch television, we're still fighting 16 years after 9-11. What do we call the enemy? Do we call them Islamists? Do you call them Islamic extremists? Radical Islamic extremists? Or, oh, I love this one, losers. <laughs> what do we call them? That indicates that we have no understanding of what the enemy is. So, every time we have a disaster, we always talk about, my God, we could not imagine something like this will happen. That's the very first thing. Even the 9-11 Commission, <laughs> they spent millions of dollars on investigating, and they did a great job. But they called the 9-11 attack a failure of imagination. They said every time they talked to people in the intelligence community and law enforcement community, they said, we could not imagine a plane hit a building. Tom Clancy wrote a novel about it, but, you know, they could not imagine. Fine. Paul Wolfowitz, when he went and testified in front of Congress, he said, we cannot imagine it's going to take more troops to secure Iraq than it's going to take us to take down Saddam. Cannot imagine. Why? Because our imagination is limited. Our imagination is limited with our experiences, limited our, uh, our views of history, uh, our, our understanding of the others. It's limited with our own expertise. It's limited with our own prejudices. So what do we need to do? We need to expand our imagination. How do you expand our imagination? You expand your imagination by adding empathy to it. And I don't mean empathy in the colloquial sense to be sympathetic to these guys. No, I mean empathy in the clinical sense. Understanding their motivation, understanding their views of history, understanding their views of religion, understanding their views of their own history. This is what gives us a better understanding of how they operate. This is what gives us a sense of predictability of what they're going to do. And I hope in this book, in a small little way, I contribute to that understanding. 
So I did not want to write another terrorism book. I did not want to write another black banners or another, you know, uh, terrorism book like many of the some excellent terrorism books out there. I don't want to write a book about policy, about geopolitics. I don't want to write a book about, you know, whose fault was it something like this happened. Uh, you know, this is not what this book is all about. This book is about delving into the personalities and the characters of people who want to do us harm. Men who caused so much bloodshed and suffering and understanding them not only on a personal level but also on ideological level. So this book tells you the history of the terrorist uh, organizations and the terrorist message that we deal with today from the beginning until today. I start with Bin Laden. I start with Bin Laden escaping Tora Bora. And I talk about his relationship with his family, his relationships with his commanders, his relationships with his, um, you know, uh, other uh, uh, senior members of Al-Qaeda, his, how he was micromanaging Al-Qaeda. A lot of people here were used to say, oh, he's in a cave. You know, no, he was micromanaging the organization. He was micromanaging the way they negotiate hostages. He was micromanaging the way they operate. He was micromanaging the training uh, um, uh, manuals uh, that they brainwashed the new recruits with. He was micromanaging the organization. And um, how his views changed. Views changed after 9-11. It became a message. Then uh, affiliates and how do you control the affiliates? He, he was so concerned that his brand need to be intact that actually he sent an order to Al-Qaeda and the Islamic Maghrib saying, you know what? You guys have no idea what I'm talking about. You know why? Because you don't speak Arabic. So a sahab, the media arm of Al-Qaeda, translate everything to French when you send it over there. Because I want them to understand what I'm talking about. So this is kind of, you know, this he was a micromanager in so many different ways. So Bin Laden, I go from, from, from the time he left Afghanistan until he was killed uh, by the Navy SEAL. And then um, uh, the, the new leader uh, they appointed was an interim leader uh, to get all the allegiances, the bayat, from all the different affiliates and all the different commanders for the one who was known to be the number two in Al-Qaeda, Ayman Zawahiri. Uh, that was Saif al-Adil. Saif al-Adil is an Egyptian. He um, was with Al-Qaeda, or still actually, but I cannot say was, he's, he's still alive. He has been with Al-Qaeda uh, from day one. He was one of the founding members. And he was involved virtually with every operation Al-Qaeda did against anyone to include all the attacks against U.S. interests. Um, Saif um, was an Egyptian special forces uh, before he joined the organization and he was very loyal to bin Laden. But Saif disagreed with bin Laden on 9-11. He thought that 9-11 can be a disaster for Al-Qaeda and Taliban. Uh, most of the original members of Al-Qaeda told bin Laden at the Shura Council meeting no, don't do that. Only Zawahiri and the flea loaders, the Egyptian flea loaders who came from EIJ, told him, no, we're with you. Bin Laden did not get the votes for 9-11, but he decided to go with it anyway. Saif al-Adil now is in a position to collect all the allegiances because he's very well known among all the members of Al-Qaeda and very trusted. Um, through Saif, I introduce Al-Qaeda from the beginning until he's collecting all the allegiances. And then I go to all the different affiliates. And um, what do we know about the leaders of all these affiliates? So it's not a terrorism book as much as it's a novel with real characters, characters who actually created a lot of damage and a lot of bloodshed. So with Saif al-Adil, understanding the organization, understanding the history of the organization, and then understanding the, all the divisions, the internal divisions inside the organization. For example, the head of Al-Qaeda in, the, in, in Horn of, uh, the Horn of Africa, um, the person who basically was instrumental in establishing a Shabab movement in Somalia, a guy from the Comoros, his name is Harun Fadul. Harun did not want to give bayat to Ayman Zawahiri. Harun in the old days when he was involved in the East Africa embassy bombing used to be the chief of staff of this guy, Saif al -Adil. And he told him, look, I think that Zawahiri guy is a freeloader. Free 
You know, he's not he's not one of us. Just because he fooled Bin Laden, it doesn't mean that I'm going to give him my bayah. And then suddenly Harun was killed at a checkpoint, um, you know, by, by the Somali forces. Now, I don't make any conclusions or judgments who killed him. I keep it up to you to decide who killed him by reading that novel, right? Um, but the most... Um, um, uh, uh, rogue affiliate that gave them so gave Al Qaeda in Afghanistan in, 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 in Waziristan so much headache is Al Qaeda in Iraq and especially that guy Az Zarqawi who established Al Qaeda in Iraq and there's a lot of ideological differences between how Az Zarqawi viewed the jihad and how Bin Laden and Zawahiri viewed the jihad why because Zarqawi was not a member of Al Qaeda in Afghanistan so when, when he started in Iraq, he wasn't a Qaeda member. Later he became a Qaeda member. So uh, a Zarqawi's view is to basically uh, kill anyone who disagree with you, including Shia, including Sunnis. In Iraq alone, in Al Ambar province alone, which is the biggest Sunni province in Iraq, Zarqawi and his henchmen killed 250 Sunni scholars to evacuate Iraq, to evacuate the Sunni towns and to evacuate the Sunni cities in Iraq from any legitimate uh, religious scholars, right? Most of his henchmen were all from North Africa, specifically Libya and Tunisia. So the whole thing with Tunisia did not start after the Arab Spring. It was always there among the Takfiri groups. So um, Al-Qaeda were really annoyed. They actually established a committee in Afghanistan just to focus on Zarqawi and his actions. Uh, Zawahiri sent him a letter and he said, what are you doing? Take it easy about the killing like this. And guess what, dude? Why do you behead people? A bullet can do the job. See, see, they are not arguing with him about the killing. They are all for the killing. But how do you do it? You know, beheading, yeah, man, it makes people just don't like us. Think about the brand. We have a brand to protect here. So the differences between Zarqawi and the leadership in Afghanistan is actually the root of the division in the global jihadi movement that we see later on between Al-Qaeda and between ISIS, right? Because ISIS is the group that Zarqawi established in Iraq. So hopefully after you read the Zarqawi chapter, you know everything about the Iraq war. And then you can make your own judgment. Was the Iraq war worth it or not? Because I look at it from their perspective, right? So then we go to Zawahiri, and Zawahiri is an old man who has been active in the jihadi movement, the Islamic jihadi movement in the Middle East for a long time. So Zawahiri introduces the modern Middle East. And then with the modern Middle East, we have Syria today. We have Yemen today. So you see how um, Syria and the war in Syria gave a new bloodline for Al-Qaeda and for ISIS because when Al-Qaeda went to Iraq and uh, sorry went to Syria the affiliate in Iraq went to Syria so ISIS what's now ISIS the Islamic State in Iraq at the time sent commanders to set up an affiliate in Syria and then they decided those guys in Syria that the Syria Jihad is different than Iraq Jihad right it's two different things so we need our own affiliate Al-Qaeda in Iraq said ah you guys are in, under our own control. They said, well, let's go to the leader and ask him. Right? So they went to Zawahiri, and Zawahiri said, you know what? Yeah, Syria and Iraq are different. Oh, you traitor, you Zawahiri, you believe in sykes pical You believe in divisions between Iraq and Syria? No, 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 no. By, by the way, we established a state, and we're going to raise you a caliphate now, and you have to give us bayah. We're not going to give you bayah. We are the true followers of Osama bin Laden. You're a traitor. You're not the real follower of Osama bin Laden. So what we, the reason I'm telling you this story is because now we see that it is a message. It's more and more a message. If you hear ISIS or you hear Al-Qaeda, does it really matter? It is the same ideology that was uh, planted in the heads of many of these people by Osama bin Laden. Right? So what we have today is um, an, uh, a message that uh, directly, directly uh, benefits from the chaos that exists. 
If you want to drown the narrative of extremism, you cannot drown it with the war in Syria and the war in Iraq and the war in Yemen. You know, if you want to do that, it's like trying to put down a kitchen fire with a small little towel when the stove is still on. I mean, it's not going to happen. It's, it's providing imagery. It's providing uh, places where people can go and train and, 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 and feel part of groups. And unfortunately, um, um, allies and enemies are utilizing these civil wars to score points. And these guys are embedding themselves and their ideology and their message in the middle of these geopolitical conflicts. So now where are we today? ISIS is definitely dwindling. ISIS used to always say baqiya wa tatamaddad, which means remaining and expanding. Well, it's definitely not remaining and obviously not expanding. I mean, they are losing territory left and right in Iraq and Syria. So in the same time, Al-Qaeda is laying low, building the network, rebuilding the network, uh, benefiting greatly from all these civil wars, as I mentioned earlier. So Al-Qaeda is very happy to have ISIS take the credit for anything that's happening. Right? Let them focus on ISIS for a little bit until we're ready. And when ISIS is no more, when there's no caliphate and no caliph, that oath of allegiance, that bayah, will cease to exist. So what's going to happen to all these people who are members of ISIS? I think many of them will go back to the mother organization. Now, they're not going to go back to the mother organization if Zawahiri is still the leader because they really hate Dov Zawahiri. And I don't blame them. My God, the guy is so boring. I mean, if I watch, I try sometimes to watch his 45 minutes videotapes that he puts. By, by minute two, I want to blow myself up just to stop listening to him. I mean, he's the most boring human being you can imagine. No charisma whatsoever. He never did anything that was successful. He failed every, you know, at every corner of his life. But I think what's going to happen is, which Al-Qaeda's Al wise men, if you want to call them, the older guys in Al-Qaeda, I think they have a trump card to play. No pun intended here. <laughs> I swear. <laughs> Figure of speech. They are losers. Big time. So uh, anyway, um, so, um, so what, what they're going to do is, I, I can see after ISIS uh, ceases to exist, I can see them bring in Hamza bin Laden to be the new leader for Al-Qaeda. First, he's a bin Laden. He's young. He's millennial. Um, he uh, was trained for the last seven, eight years by some of the top commanders in Al-Qaeda, people that his father did not have access to their counsel because all of them were together in house arrest in Iran in the same place. He got married to the number two person in Al-Qaeda's daughter, um, Abu Muhammad al-Masri, who has been involved in virtually also every terrorist attack uh, that happened against, uh, against us and in the world. He masterminded the, the East Africa embassy bombings himself. Uh, so I, I think uh, Hamza is going to be uh, the person. And Hamza already had about five different messages. Um, at the very beginning, they always called him Brother Mujahid Hamza Osama bin Laden. Uh, in the last uh, message, the announcement and the message uh, both referred to him as Sheikh. Hamza bin Laden, which indicates a promotion, because you cannot be the leader of Al-Qaeda without having the title sheikh. So I think um, if you listen to his statements, and I've been listening to all his statements, you will see something really interesting. He never attacks ISIS. He never mentions the caliphate. He never attacked the caliph. That's something Zawahiri does. Zawahiri always attacks them. Hamza doesn't. Hamza actually say, what's happening in Iraq and in Syria and in Libya and Somalia, what's happening in Algeria and in Mali, what's happening everywhere. All these guys are Mujahideen and they are the followers of Osama bin Laden. He says, look, you people in the West, we used to be only in Kandahar. Now we're everywhere. And his tone, he tried to copy his father. He tried to copy his father. His tone is exactly the tone of Osama bin Laden. And his message, identical to what bin Laden used to say. Same statements sometimes. In his last statements, the, the one before last where he um, gave his commandments for uh, martyrdom uh, operatives in the West, 
He said, look, try to kill as many people as you can. So it's like that. Don't just take a knife and yeah, try to do it right, you know. And then he said, and always leave a message why you did it. And I'm telling you why you did it. So I'm telling you what to say. Number one, our lands are occupied. The land of the whole two holy places, meaning Saudi Arabia, is occupied. We did not hear that since Osama bin Laden died. We did not hear that since 9-11. He brought it back. Palestine. If we don't live in peace in Palestine, you will never know peace in America and in the West. Well, that's something bin Laden said himself. But also we did not hear that in how long? Long, long, long time ago. Then he talked about stealing the wealth of the Muslim world. Right? We did not hear that for a long time. He's bringing it back. He only had one thing that we did not hear his father talk about. What's happening in Asham? What's happening in Syria? The murders of the Assad regime and the Russians. Which they sa- he said that we're doing attacks in the West because you're supporting them. You're supporting their atrocities in Syria. That's the only thing he added. And frankly, he cannot mention he cannot not mention Syria when the largest affiliate of Al Qaeda is in Syria. But he's bringing back the original message of Osama bin Laden. And I talk about his character. I talk about his childhood. He was a poster child for Al Qaeda. At the early days, if you look at the old videotapes of Al Qaeda, he's always saying these fiery speeches, these poems. When he was a kid, he's training with the Mujahideen, and he told his father, he said, "Father." When I was in jail, I learned a lot. And you're going to be proud of me. I'm, I, I learned about this. I learned about that. But now I feel I'm forged by steel. And I am ready to march with the legions of the Mujahideen under your commander. Bin Laden, from all his sons who were released, and you know, he wanted only two people to come and join him. His wife, Khairiya, which is a PhD, older than him. And she has only one son, Hamza. And his wife wasn't just a wife. She was his advisor. She was his um, um, wordsmith. She was his conciliar, literally. He wanted her to come not because he missed his wife after she has been in jail in Iran for seven, eight years. He wanted her to come and he threatened his commander. If you don't bring her here, I will myself go up to Waziristan and bring her here. Which his commander is like, oh my god, this guy lost his mind. Well, what do you mean he, you're going to come and bring? But then we know why. Because he wanted her, he wanted her to basically work on his statement on the anniversary of the 10th anniversary of 9-11. He wanted her to tell him what to say. Right? And when they could not bring her to him, he actually, you know, was convinced finally and he sent her a letter he said hey you know what the 10th anniversary is coming and you know how important this is so I told uh, you know Atiyah who's his chief of staff to buy you a computer and USBs and please start working on the statements for the 10th anniversary of 9-11 so she is the son of Hamza who pushed Hamza more and more towards following up in his father's footsteps she is kind of like the woman behind uh, the father and the son so uh, today, we see Al Qaeda trying to wait until uh, 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 ISIS totally dwindled, and I believe after th- uh, ISIS totally dwindles, I think a new Bin Laden will come and claim, claim uh, that message, claim the ownership of that message, and I think um, they will be successful with that. So six years ago, on May second. 2011, we killed UBL. But ladies and gentlemen, the story of HBL did not even begin. Thank you, and I'm open for questions. So the first question is always the easiest one. Um, we know what Trump's strategy is. Kill them all. Drive them out. Um, we've had messages, or we've tried to, people in the government have tried to 
do social media and films and the kinds of things that they do. And our efforts were called laughable by some expert last night. Um, if you could talk to Trump and he would listen to you, uh, what would there's a lot of ifs. Uh, that's right. Oh, that's I'm right. sorry. Um, but what would you suggest? How do we um, how do we deal with their message? What do we offer yeah. instead? Uh, that's actually a very good question. And uh, as you probably expected, uh, the answer is not as easy. But I'm going to try to simplify it uh, as much as I can. The last chapter of this book called Slaying the Hydra, because I believe the message and the terrorist group is like a hydra. And how do we kill that hydra? And there is some stuff that we need to do. First of all, we need to deal with the threat as it exists today, not as it existed 16 years ago. Right? So... What are the incubating factors that's feeding into the threat today? Number one, civil wars that's happening across the Middle East. Number two, regional power using sectarianism to settle scores against each other other and create geopolitical sphere of influence in the Middle East. Number three, a narrative that it claims that the United States and the West are at war with Islam and that's why you have to fight back. Even though that narrative, 95% of its victim are Muslims. They killed way more Muslims than they killed anyone else. They are blowing up mosques in Saudi Arabia, mosques in Kuwait. Last Ramadan, they blew up the mosque of the Prophet, where the Prophet is, is buried in Medina. And then they say that they were defend, the defenders of Islam, right? So we have to expose them. And we cannot expose them as government. I can guarantee you any government in the world including the United States, when they start doing this kind of messaging, people are going to laugh at them. And they're going to laugh at them more than Sisi, out of all people, and Salman in Saudi Arabia, and Trump putting their hand on that orb and saying, go away, go away. It's not gonna happen. <laughs> right? So, so this is, this is not going to work like this. You have to allow civil societies to stand up, communities to stand up. And in every country, it's going to be different because there is no cookie cutter approach. The threat that we have in the United States is very different than what they have in Belgium or what they have in France or what they have in Germany. We don't have community-based recruitment in the United States like they have in, in, in Brussels, for example. We don't have that. Most of the threat that we have is through social media. Uh, people who are disfranchised, people who are alienated, they listen to this message and they get brainwashed. They have no connections with these terrorist groups. They get inspired by the message and they go ahead and do it. We've seen that in New York. We've seen that in San Bernardino. We've seen that in Orlando. It's very different than in Europe. So what we need to do in the United States is develop a message based on the threat that we have here at home or how we can make that message inclusive, right? So there are a lot of things we need to do. But all these things that I'm talking about, they fit under one thing called a strategy. And believe it or not, 16 years after 9-11, we still don't have it. We have no strategy. We put, we put, that's not even a strategy, you know, we, we tried that, you know, you cannot kill them all, you know, this is, it's, it's impossible. If you keep doing the same thing again and again and again and expecting different results, that's, that's the main definition of insanity, exactly. So we have to develop a comprehensive strategy and from all the, but only from the three or four peop, uh, things that I mentioned, and there's a big list that we can go through, but for the sake of time. Only this, you, you, you see that we need diplomats. We need civil society. We need law enforcement. We need military. Because you know what? There are some people who are inside these terrorist groups, and I always get attacked when I say that. There is only two ways out. Two ways out. The bullet and the handcuffs. And we have to put that also on the table. We have to understand that. But as long as there are more recruits joining, we won't have enough bullets and we won't have enough handcuffs. So we need to basically stop the influx of recruits to these organizations. What is uh, creating that influx? It differs from, different, uh, from country to another. But there is one common factor today is these civil wars that brought new blood 
new fronts of jihad for these groups. That's why we have 5,000 foreign fighters from Europe, 7,000 from the uh, for, uh, former Soviet republics, 6,000 from Tunisia. We have about 40,000 foreign fighters who went to join terrorist groups in Iraq and Syria. And I'm not talking about those who went to Yemen or Somalia or other places. Now, granted, most of these guys luckily died, were killed. 20% uh, of them were able to go back to their countries. And we've seen the havoc that they were able to create. You know? And there are some people who are still there, but they can still instigate, they can still inspire, they can still convince people back home or family members back home or friends back home to conduct terrorist attacks. And I think we start seeing that in Manchester from the, from the results of the investigation. So we need to basically find solutions to all these things. And I wish the solution is as easy as calling them losers. Thank you. Thank you, man. Good evening. Thank you for your service. Thank uh, you, sir. Two, uh, two short questions I'll try. Uh, but uh, the recent crisis after that's unfolded in recent days, uh, UK police have cut off U.S. law enforcement from access after... For an hour. For an hour. Uh, then they, they realize that they need us more than we need them, so it's back. <laughs> With all due respect. So... Uh, well, also today, uh, President appearing at NATO, and apparently his national security staff had to go and clean up his mess, uh, so to speak, after his speech at NATO. So that's not news. No. <laughs> I'm sorry. But, uh, well, what do you think the long-term consequences of this sort of schizophrenic approach will be? And also your thoughts on uh, the looming tower going into production. I love that. I cannot wait until I watch it. It's going to be weird for me watching it, but I love it. The Looming Tower. I, I know Norton will kill me, but it's one of my favorite books. Uh, so can I say that? <laughs> I guess I can. Um, Larry Wright is a mentor uh, of mine. So um, the uh, first question, I think, about um, uh, about the... Um, the uh, the information sharing with our partners in the UK. Look, you know, I, I worked with uh, the folks in the UK. I actually was involved 17 years ago in an operation, 18 years ago, an operation in Manchester targeting the Libyan fighting groups on Al Qaeda uh, with the Manchester police. Um, uh, the Manchester police have total uh, jurisdiction over uh, the greater city of Manchester. The people who handle terrorism in the UK are based in London, and it used to be SO12. They used to do intel and SO-13 criminal, and then after 9-11, they combined them together and made them SO-15. Um, so uh, I had the pleasure to work with those guys, and they are the best of the best, and I have nothing but amazing respect for our partners in the U.K., um, and as an investigator who was involved in highly sensitive investigation and disruptions, I, I know firsthand how frustrating it is to be working against the time, to try to figure out who the terrorists are and try to, to arrest them. And suddenly, the most precious information that you have uh, to, you know, to, that gives you the upper hand, you see it on CNN or you read it in the New York Times. It's so frustrating. And get, let me tell you, uh, you know, I don't think that is only frustrating. I think it's dangerous, and I think it risks lives, and I think it's reckless. Whoever is doing the leaks uh, need to be held accountable. Now, I don't blame all the leaks to our people here in the United States. I think that is not fair. They are talking about the leaks, for example, of the bomb and the detonator in the New York Times. Well, I, I happen to trust the New York Times. I don't know how, you know, but I happen to trust if the New York Times said that they get the pictures by sources in the British law enforcement. I happen to trust that. I don't think they're going to say they got it from um, sources in the British government if the people who gave uh, the, 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 the pictures are in the United States. They could have said law enforcement. You know, why did they say British? Now, the leak of the name, I totally, I totally agree with our British colleagues, and it seems that it was leaked here in the United States. But you know what? It's an international investigation, right? And we should not... I, mean, I, I don't want to repeat what I said about how much I hate leaks, but it is an international investigation. And just after it was leaked in an AP story, 
the Libyans said, hey, we arrested his father and his brother, and this is his father and his brother, so the name was going to come out. I think there's a lot of frustration going on. I don't blame our British partners for being so frustrated and so upset. I understand how it is when you're trying to deal with an imminent threat that caused the government of your country to raise the, 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 the terror threat to critical. That means it's an imminent attack. Um, taken place and to see some of the information that you have on television I will be very frustrated but the only thing I I kind of not there yet to blame all the leaks to uh, uh, you know to uh, uh, to people in the United States maybe American media yes but not necessarily people in the law enforcement and the intelligence community in America I, 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 I'm, I'm not there yet I'm not there yet thank you thank you all right. Well, the third question is the hardest, what I've been told. So you mentioned, I believe... That's the sixth question, my friend, so go ahead. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, previously, you answered the question about relative balance between military, law enforcement, diplomatic tactics. I was curious that since 1998 and the cruise missile strikes in Afghanistan and Sudan, um, these sorts of tactics, airstrikes, raids, drone strikes, missiles, have been a very quick sort of Swiss Army knife, and I was curious how you break the inertia of using these military tactics in place of longer-lasting strategies when they get such favorable public results oftentimes. I, I, think, um, I, I think it's a very good question, and I think we always go and depend on our military because they do the job very well, and they are amazing in what they do, uh, but I don't think it's uh, fair to uh, have them deal with all the incompetencies of our politicians here in Washington, <laughs> right? We have been in Afghanistan more, the, uh, Afghanistan has been the longest war, more than World War I, World War II, and the Vietnam War altogether. And guess what? The reason we have been there is because under three different administrations, the politicians haven't been able to break a deal in Afghanistan, right? So what we do is the, 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 the things that Washington loves to do best. They put a can and they kick it down the road. It's like, guys, hey, we'll deal with it later. And then the military, hey, can you, can you stay there? Can you do this again? Okay, do what again? They're like, what, um, seven, 8,000 miles away from home? trying to secure a tribal society that never knew the meaning of central government? having the same strategy that the, the, the Russians used for 10 years and it did not work that well for them either? Doing what? Where, is, where are the diplomats? How are we going to have a deal in Afghanistan? We can't just put red lines around everything and then say to the military, go. Oh, the military will do a great job. The military kicked out, Afga kicked out Taliban and Al-Qaeda from Afghanistan in a very short period of time, secured the whole country, and then politicians failed to deliver. And when they fail to deliver, we say, oh, yeah, we're going to stay in Afghanistan some more. The military deal with it. It's not fair. Just because they do a phenomenal job, we should not task them to do every job. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I find what you say very interesting because any, any great uprising anywhere, the intrigue within the organizations and the personalities is fascinating. <coughs> what concerns me though, not just about your presentation, but about the way the issue is being dealt with is the three points that you mentioned and there was a fourth. We don't seem to be able to understand ourselves. In other words, we don't know what we've done in the name of America. Most citizens have no idea what's been done throughout the world. And it's a shame that we, we use our young people to fight these wars, which to a large degree we have contributed to. In other words, we're continually cleaning up our own mess. So the point I'm getting at is beyond the intrigue how are we going to understand the true dynamics of our foreign policy, what we've done, the truth within their message, which exists? Yeah. And how are we going to grasp what's going on now so there isn't this endless 
fire of, of hate and and because the world has to move on I think my answer is one word knowledge and that is exactly the reason I wrote this book and that is the reason I wrote it the way I wrote it, as a novel but you don't deal so with our foreign policy it is there I mean it is there but I am not giving you a lecture about our foreign policy you the reader will come to the conclusion if torture was right you the reader you'll come to the conclusion if the Iraq war was in our national security interest you the reader will look will come to the conclusion about our alliances in the region what work and what don't work I don't want to lecture anyone let them make their own conclusions after they read the facts as the bad guys see them and I call them bad guys because you know what I think they are evil I think they are bad guys um, you know I, I fought them for so many years so yes they are bad guys and they are evil uh, but you can make their own conclusion we don't have that knowledge we don't have the deep understanding of what the enemy is and I agree with you and I said it so many times in different speeches you know I always uh, I'm a big uh, I love Sun Tzu and uh, I love a lot of his strategy advice but I think the biggest problem we have in this so-called war on terror that it's not like we did not understand the enemy when we started this war we forget who we are as a nation we lost our moral compass and um, you know that gives you an idea how smart Sun Tzu is what we do to create the enemies which we continually have to fight I hope people will get to their in conclusion with this how does the United States perspective or as you put it non-perspective on the war on terror compare with that the Russian can we really trust the Russians to be a true ally on the war on terror which we're trying to do in Syria right now <coughs> or supposedly trying to do yeah I, I think I, I don't know if um, if there's an agreement uh, frankly between the administration and between you know the Pentagon and the intelligence community about how to how to approach Syria and how to approach the whole situation with Russia I thought it was interesting when uh, the president uh, spoke to the leaders of the Muslim world I think he lost a significant opportunity to speak to the Muslim world he spoke to 50 people some of them are autocrats some of them are dictators some of them have no connections with their people and he spoke with them as if he's speaking to the Muslim world and um, he said you know he, he attacked Iran and rightly so Iran has been a menace in the region for so many different uh, decades since the Iranian revolution since Khomeini to different degrees to various degrees and he attacked Hezbollah because Hezbollah and Iran are helping the Assad regime commit atrocities in Syria well let me tell you something the Iranians and Hezbollah and all the Shiite militia with all the respect excuse my language they will have their asses handed to them if it wasn't for the Russians and he didn't mention Russia it was it's it's Russians air support that's helping them on the ground it's uh, it, it's Russian bombings that's making them uh, hold their positions so um, so there's something here about you know how how uh, we're not including suddenly Russia which is part of the problem as much as Iran as much as Hezbollah as much as all the other players in the region um, I, and I think this is this is one of the things that you know we need to figure out can we do a deal with the Russians uh, to fight this form of terrorism because let me tell you the Russians are in Syria not only to support Assad the Russians are in Syria in order to protect Moscow that's why they are there not only geopolitically but also from a terrorism perspective you have 7,000 foreign fighters who came from former Soviet republics and joined Al-Qaeda and ISIS in Syria and you know if I am Putin I want to kill them all in Syria I don't want them to come back right so so there is something that we can work with the Russians on however I don't think uh, there is trust I think there is a significant gap of mistrust between us between a lot of allies uh, or so-called allies and between Russians and their allies and so-called allies thank you Let's do last two questions. yeah hi why do I why do I have the prejudice that Islamist clergy is it more outgoing and forthcoming on providing an alternative to the extremists 
Um, I think because you probably don't use Google and Google how a lot of them stand up and talk ag against it. Uh, most of the people in the Muslim world are against uh, this thing. I, I don't see it uh, eye to eye with you. Al-Azhar spoke out. Many of the big clergy spoke out around the Muslim world. It's like me saying, why don't I see white people going and protesting Dylan Roof, killing black people in a Charles in Charleston? Because they, Dylan Roof does not represent you. Dylan Roof represents himself and the radical ideology that brainwashed him online, by the way, um, and, 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 and radicalized him. So I, I, I'm not one of these guys that jump and say, hey, they're not speaking up, they're not standing up. 95% of the victims are Muslims. Okay, the people who are fighting ISIS today in Syria and Iraq and Yemen, the people who are fighting Al Qaeda, are all Muslims. The people who are dying on the front lines are Muslims. So it's not a clash of civilization, my friend. It is an intercivilizational clash. It's Shia killing Sunni, Sunni killing Shia, Kurds killing Turks, Turks killing Arabs, Arabs killing Persians. What we see today is something we've seen in the 16th century and 17th century. You have Russian czars and Turkish sultans and caliphs, and they are battling each other on the same fault lines that they battled each other on back in the 16th and 17th century. History is not over. Sorry, Professor Fukuyama. History just returned. Uh, thanks for being here, and thanks again for your service. Uh, I'm Thank wondering... Um, how you think we should approach the problem of kind of the spread of the radical ideology. I mean, uh, so in reading some reports about this, right, you hear that like uh, a lot of the spread of Wahhabism, for example, is Absolutely. funded by the Sauds in places like Belgium and France and Germany yeah. and a lot of Europe. Balkans, how, Southeast yes. Asia. So how, how, how do we go about actually combating this kind of radical ideology, which is, you know, uh, less rational, right? It's more irrational and just based upon some yeah. kind of radicalization and radical interpretation of the religion. I would like to use radical Wahhabism, not Wahhabism, as, as, as a sect, but uh, that's something we've been seeing since 1979. I, actually, after the um, uh, some radical Wahhabis took the uh, mosque in Mecca as a hostage, uh, you know, the Saudis felt that they need to uh, do something in order to cater to the more extreme elements in their society and create a Another kind of alliance between the religious establishment and the House of Saud to have legitimacy. So basically, they told them, "Hey, you know what? Why are you going to fight uh, the king?" By the time uh, he was the king, later King Fahad decided maybe I should call myself uh, the protector of the two holy places or the servant of the two holy places. Why do you want to fight him when you can go and fight those infidel? Russians. So they start paying for all these people to go to Afghanistan. Uh, so it's kind of, and then they supported them, and then they felt that, hey, you know what? Um, they are riding a tiger, and God knows what's going to happen to them when they get off. And we've seen what happened to them. Um, and, and then they said, okay, you know what? Iran is trying to expand its revolution in Southeast Asia and Africa and so many different places. We have to counter Iran. Um, those Sunnis, the moderate, regular Muslims, regular Sunnis, um, those are really fools because they're going to believe Iranian lies. So let's make them radical Wahhabis so they won't deal with Shia at all, right? And unfortunately, that backfired in so many different ways. Uh, in the old days, we've seen it, we've seen what happened in Bali, what happened in Indonesia, whatever. And now it's happening again to counter Iran. And suddenly, supporting the groups like Al Qaeda became okay because they are the moderates. We all the people we hate is those guys, ISIS. And 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 I think this is one of the things that I wish the president uh, forced the Saudis to do, and instead of putting his hand with the orb, with basically the two entities, Saudi Arabia and Egypt, that he created most of the terrorism mm -hmm. and, around the world. Um, Egypt because of the torture of these guys and Saudi because of the ideology. We need to hold these guys accountable because they are the first people who are going to be targeted and, uh, you know, who are going to get hurt by uh, this, this uh, terrorist threat. As how we combat it, it differs. I think in the United States, we need to create a space, a cyberspace for the good people. The bad people have spaces. You know, you can go and radicalize yourself to be a white supremacist or to be jihadi or to be any kind of bigot online. 
But where is my space and your space? It does not exist. And that's something we're actually doing now. We're creating a new 501c3. It's, it's, it's a campaign called Index, bringing a Madison Avenue and bringing um, a Silicon Valley uh, together in order to create a platform uh, that can be inclusive, an American platform, who we are as a nation, a melting pot, a shining city on the hill. Ronald Reagan used to say, you can live in England, but you will never be considered an Englishman. You can live in France, but you can never be called a Frenchman. But if you live in America, you are an American. Let's go back to that. That's what made America great. Let's go back to that. So when we want to do a counter narrative, we cannot say, okay, you know, this is called CVE and it's only for the Muslim communities because every Muslim is going to be like, I don't know what you're talking about, right? And then you bring these people who can barely speak English. They look different. They have big beards. A guy just came from Pakistan and now he's an imam. And you say, hey, this is a representative of the Muslim community. Really? Nobody came to me or to any of my family members or friends or my community to ask me about how I feel about it. Right? So what we need to do is we need to have a comprehensive platform against extremism because hate, extremism is not an American value. Tolerance is an American value. And we give you that platform so you can educate, you can uh, connect with other people, you can mobilize against state and against extremism, and then you can do with it whatever you want. All the branding, everything, it's up to you. So you can stand up against white supremacists, you can stand up against Islamists, you can stand up against any way you want. So we need to create that space because most of the problems we have in America is based on identity. People who have nothing else to do, they watch these tapes, they are losers. This guy in, uh, in, 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 in uh, what you call it, in, uh, in um, uh, Orlando, he wanted to be a cop. Nobody will hire him to be a police officer. And then he flipped and went crazy. Uh, so there, there are so many different reasons that these guys went on the path that they went in. But there's something in common, which is an identity issue that um, kind of allured them to a, a specific set of historic and religious and the theological interpretation of how these groups see the world today. Uh, okay. Before uh, asking my question, I do want to say that I really admire you. I admired your totally uh, rational uh, stance against torture. Um, sorry. Thank you. You're a very say. smart lady. <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I'll come and pat you. <laughs> uh, my question, and maybe it's simplistic, but you talk about it just seems that death runs through all of what uh, it, these uh, extremists were uh, are thinking about killing other people, but also uh, uh, death as a martyr is treasured, or it's certainly preached. Uh, yeah. um, and I don't see how you combat uh, people who uh, uh, are so wedded to death. Well, that's why I mentioned, ma'am, that um, there are some people that if they really want to go to heaven, we should give them a, a ticket. I mean, <laughs> uh, absolutely, I, I believe in that. And then let them go and see the 69, 79, whatever number of versions they're going to get over there. It's between them, Viagra, and God. Um, but I, I, think, I, I think what's going to happen is... Um, you know, we need to discredit the ideology, discredit the message to prevent more people from joining. Uh, we cannot um, sustain uh, what's happening by allowing more and more people to join. And people are joining not because of the ideology. People are joining because of the images they see in civil war areas. People are joining because of assimilation problems, for example, in Europe. People are joining because of, um, uh, you know, uh, sectarianism. People, everybody gets into this kind of universe, this orbit. Uh, there's a different gravity that sucked them in. And I think we need to have a solution 
information that based on different regions and different countries. But I think what we need to do first is to protect our own country by developing a comprehensive strategy inside the United States to limit this kind of extremism. And then at the same time, engage with diplomatic initiatives in order to um, express to our friends and our foes around the world that there is no zero-sum game here. You know, you need to have a political solution. Not go and give them $250 billion worth of weapons to add it to the fire that's already raging in places like Yemen, in places like Syria, right? Not going in front of the Muslim world and talk about how many hundreds of billions of dollars you get and jobs, jobs, jobs. I love jobs, jobs, jobs. Believe me, who doesn't? I want these things to come to America. But you're talking to a Muslim world where millions of people are hungry in refugee camps. You're talking to a Muslim world that people have no infrastructure. Most of the Arab countries have no electricity 24-7. No water. You're talking to a Muslim world where children are dying and you see the pictures of what's happening in Yemen. You're talking to a Muslim world that more than 65% of young people don't even have jobs. You're talking to a Muslim world that is in total mess. And you tell them, oh, I just took um, about $350 million out of your money. Jobs, jobs, jobs. I love this. Thank you. <laughs> the substance of the, che- the speech is great because the bar is so low with all the respect. It's, you know, you didn't say radical Islamic extremism. We say we didn't say we're in a civilizational war with Islam. Great. I love the, sub- I, I love the rhetoric. But the substance itself is disastrous because that is what Hamza bin Laden now is using stealing our money yeah exactly that's the message of Osama bin Laden that is if you have time google the 1996 declaration of jihad of Osama bin Laden and compare it to the summit that took place in Riyadh we went backward to the 90s thank you Thank you so much for that wonderful talk and for all your questions. The book is available for purchase at the registers. If you would like your copy signed, please line up to my left, your right. Thank you.